Good morning, everyone. I greet you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we gather. Well, it's really nice to hear you. Thank you. We are praying people. And so we begin simply our services as we have for the past few years, and that is we pray. So look around the room as the Spirit leads, guides, directs. Uh, take a moment and pray, and then it's my privilege to pray for all of us together. So let's pray. Father, from the fullness of our weeks, we come once again to the fullness of your presence in this place. Not that your presence is not full everywhere we go, but in this place built, set aside, and dedicated to a place of peace, a sanctuary in a world that can often be fatiguing and stressful. And so into this sanctuary we gather. If we're gathering in our homes or wherever we are, we gather in the fullness of the presence of your spirit that it would be a place of rest as you have promised. That we would labor for six days and on the seventh day, there would be rest. And I thank you for that. Thank you for those who have gathered here this morning. May we, through song, word, thoughts, be encouraged once again. May your spirit do his work to teach, correct, rebuke, and train in righteousness so that we would be fully equipped, lacking nothing. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Just again, I thank you to all of you who came last night, who contributed, participated, organized, prepared, and did all that you did. Uh, a couple of follow-ups. If you would like answers to the questions that uh, Keith put, uh, Keith, sorry, Chris put on the table, um, he has those. And if you have your kids weren't there and didn't get their little thing with the candy cane, I know we've got extras, and the girls would love to make sure you have one. So uh, that's just a little bit of housekeeping from there. Well, we are moving to the end of November, early into December, and you'll see some of the basics, not a lot extra going on this week, but Advent starts next week, and I believe that next Sunday is church decorating. Felicia's not, oh, did I say, is church decorating next week? Yes, it is. Okay, so we're doing the Christmas decorating next week, so uh, be prepared to kind of hang around and help that. There is a fairly long list of events that I am not going to go through for December, but I do want to focus on the food bank one at the bottom. Uh, the hampers are going out on the 21st, so if you can help by delivering one or two of those hampers, uh, you can either speak to Trout Wines, to Shelley, uh, to Donna Esau, and it's Eastwood, not Eastbound. Sorry, other Donna. That's... All right, Shelley, did you have anything you wanted to say for women's? Sure. Ladies, we need to have you register for our supper. Donna's cooking again, you know it's going to be good, so come on out. So let Donna or I know, or Shirley, or Tony, or yeah, anyone on this, on the you. And just so we got numbers, so we can buy the food and thank you for you, and have a good time. Thanks. Good. Thanks, Todd. Dylan, you want to add anything for men's ministry up there in the chambers? Um, just that Promise Keepers is coming up in March. I will be buying tickets tomorrow. I think so far we have seven or eight guys coming, some from here, some from Swift Current. Um, if you've come before, you know it's a good time. If you haven't, you don't know what you're missing, you gotta come. It's really, really cool, it's a fantastic time. Um, it's one of those things that's, you don't drive your car for years and years without changing the oil, so you really need some good spiritual maintenance as well, that's what churches, but <laughs> the, the Promise Keepers is like the heavy maintenance. Gotcha, yeah, yeah like, like the home. annual, like the annual for your airplane. Yeah, absolutely. I like, like that. The tires off, I like that. That works. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Uh, Ethan and Elena, anything for Club DJ? You're good to go? All right. Have I forgotten anything? Can I just say something about yes. the memorial service? Yes, please do, Joyce. Yeah. We're still in need of some sandwiches and squares for the memorial service on the night. Good. So you can just talk to me and we can come that way. It has been our privilege to. Uh, uh, prepare and work with uh, the family for Colin and Brianna's memorial service. Joyce is coordinating the food, Dan is coordinating the service. Uh, and we'll be meeting with Audrey again this week, I believe, yeah. to finalize some things. So if you could uh, help out in food, I know we put it out to the community and there's been some we response there. Response, yeah. So we're still not certain how many are going to attend. Yeah. That's always uh, there, but uh, continue to pray for uh, uh, all of us as we prepare to uh, be agents of grace in that very difficult of moments. Good. All right, anything else? All right, let's worship through song this morning.
I'm glad you just stand.
I have a few verses I'd like to read from Psalm 91, starting at verse 1. One who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God and whom I trust. For it is he who rescues you from the net of the trapper and from the deadly plague. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a wall. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. On their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will walk upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. Because he has loved me, I will save him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. I will satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. If you want to follow in your hymn books on this next song, it's hymn number 485, 485. just had surgery. I know uh, Shane and Brett's mom and dad, Jack and Joyce, uh, just had double cataract surgery. How are they doing? But uh, in time, in time. But that's been good. They've been able to have that. And we know that Doug's on the mend and Myrtle and Shirley are on the mend. And uh, we rejoice in those good things. And it's good to see Daryl's hairs growing back. And uh, you know, there's some good things we have cause to rejoice uh, in these days. And Elaine's with us, it's good to up and about. That, and the turkey was good, y'all slept well last night. The trip to Pan did its magic. That, uh, but that's good. Father, boldly before the throne of grace, we gather. And we 
give you praise for the good, the good that you have poured into our days, for good health care, doctors, medicine, and the provisions through the exploration of your creation that have led us to understand these truths. And we are truly grateful. Thank you for Shirley's increasing health and the promise of Merlin to have surgery in the days to come. Thank you for Jack and Joyce as they've had uh, their surgery now as they recover and heal, that they would be strengthened in these days. Pray for Brett and Shane as they would have patience to provide and care uh, for their mom and dad, their turn to provide and be caregivers. And for those who are facing surgery in the days to come, the unexpected, the questions yet unanswered, and perhaps even the worries and stress of letting people down, of knowing what to do in those moments. And I ask that your grace beyond measure be in those moments. We pray for Audrey, for Danny as he prepares for that community memorial, shares and in leadership in that place. And thank you that as a church she's reached out to us and allowed us the privilege of being a part of that moment. For Club DJ, for youth group, I pray for each uh, moment of sharing good graces. Pray for the Alsacers, for Leo on the passing of her father, that wisdom and peace beyond the understanding would rest and abide our heart, our hearts and minds. For all this and so much more, we give you thanks and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll ask the ushers to come forward now as we take this morning's on.
kids to come up to the front and sing their last song. It's got his got the whole world in his hands. <coughs> to James chapter 5. Back of the book, chapter 5, we're going to be reading verses 7 to verse 12. This comes after last week's talks on the misuse of riches. Mine just labeled exhortation. Please stand with me for the reading of the word. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But your eyes, but your yes, but your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Maybe see. Now at this time we'll dismiss the kids to... Uh, the kids church. Well, they're gone. They're gone. <laughs> Good job, kids. Everyone's a critic until they have to do it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm turned off, so to speak. Do we clap on one and three or two and four? Whenever the drummers hit the snare drum on. <laughs> Daddy, one and three or two and four? <laughs> Jack? <laughs> Lil? Whatever the drummer hits the snare on, that's what we clap on. Well, you don't want to mess with the drummer. Oh, I guess, yeah, that makes sense. But, sorry, squirrel. But, uh, <laughs> the t-shirts are coming. <laughs> Let's go. Father, fill us afresh with your word, your hope, and as need be, your conviction. The Spirit would do his great work to teach, correct, rebuke, and train us in righteousness so that we would be fully equipped, lacking nothing. That promise is ours this day and every day. And now as we turn to your word, equip us once again. In Jesus' name, amen. 
There is something about a desert island story. I used to get desert and dessert mixed up when I spelled it, which is no surprise, uh, until my son said, dessert has two S's because it always leaves you wanting more. <laughs> so des desert has only one. But there's something about those stories. Some are terrifying. Perhaps you went to school and read uh, Lord of the Flies and the terror that is there as Piggy was killed. Some are inspiring. Castaway with Tom Hanks and his Volleyball Wilson, or Robinson Crusoe, or Swiss Family Robinson. Some are funny. Have you ever seen the movie Swiss Army Man? Very funny movie about a guy uh, alone on an island, or even Gilligan's Island, oh, those poor people. Um, we might even play a little mind exercise one time just for fun. What three books would you bring on a desert island? Or what essential items would you pack in your desert island kit? I know the three people I would take with me because they could do all the work. As someone said, son, we aren't the guy that people knows. No, we aren't the guys that know people. We are the guys that people know. I like that. There's something about that theme, though, that we connect with. Uh, we find ourselves to connect it with it, and I think there are some pretty sound underpinning reasons. I think the reason that we connect with desert island or stranded stories is to think that many of us feel like we're stranded on this island of life, and that somehow we are disconnected from the good, from civilized and civilization. That the flora and the fauna around us are somehow dangerous as we move into winter. We know that it's going to be colder outside than your freezer is inside. We live in a dangerous land. And that we long within us to become connected or to reconnect with that which is better. That which is more civilized, less dangerous. To be connected with a more beautiful word. And I think you're right. I think that emotional tone that you have, that feeling of disconnect, of being stranded on a desert island with few resources around you is legitimate. And so this morning, turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 5. I want to tell you a deserted island story. Our story begins long ago. We set sail on this great ship, the SS Eden. We called her Paradise. This ship was beautiful and abundant. It had all that we need. Uh, the cruise ship of our dreams, our imaginations, and perhaps our ancient memories. We looked up from the masthead. We saw the gleaming stars above us, and we felt the sturdy deck beneath our feet. The seas were calm and the winds were fair. We sail through time and space at one with both creation and creator. Then, then the storm of sin and lawlessness, disobedience and lies, deception, shipwrecked the SS Eden. And we found humanity stranded in a harsh and unforgiving land. By the sweat of your brow, we painfully toiled, the soil now cursed with thorns and thistles. No longer were the seas calm, but now places of violence and fear. We watched brother kill brother, and the monsters who once lingered in the shadows became the beasts that now rule the land. We feared the darkness of the night and suffered under the heat of the day. But we remember Eden. See, generations later, we can still sense that the ship is sunk, paradise is lost, and we're marooned on an island and there are beasts in the darkness. And yet, as we explore this life, we find pieces of the wreckage, remnants of Eden still with us, moments of beauty, casks and kegs of life that have washed up on shore, crates of goodness to be guarded and fertile seed that we can still grow. And I want to put to you this morning that the book of James is an inventory list of the crates that we have found on the shore. Remember Gilligan's Island, they would find a radio or a coconut or a Russian astronaut or something. And slowly but surely they were able to rebuild those little moments. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And so James begins up to now, the first four chapters, is a description and begins with a description of the conditions on the island. See if this doesn't sound like a deserted desert island. To the twelve tribes scattered, hmm, no longer at home, lost. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, when your faith is tested. Life is hard. It's a test that never ends. So we find ourselves scattered people, far from home, facing trials that test our souls. We find ourselves lacking the very essential items we need to build a good life. If any of you lacks wisdom, we feel and hear the crashing of the waves around us. The one who doubts is like a wave of sea blown and tossed by the wind. It's a harsh place. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls, and its beauty is destroyed, says James. And we are tempted, dragged away by these dark beasts of evil desires, enticed <coughs> horrifically. This metaphor beyond imagination, we give birth to sin, and it grows. Our children on this island have grown, and they in turn give birth to death. What a graphic and dark image of this island. But then, oh, I love those moments. But then when it just feels like all is lost, James points us to the crates that have washed up on shore, blown in by the wind of the Spirit. Crates that will allow us to survive until the ship returns and the captain with us to restore all good things. And he points, he says, look, look on the shore. Every good and perfect gift has come down from the Father of lights, the word of truth, the first fruits of all that he has created. He says, look, the Father has put these on the wind, as it were, and they've landed on the island. And slowly, over the first four chapters, he begins to open these crates and reveal the gifts of the Father. There's a map, he says. Ah, the perfect law of freedom. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, there's the thick and warm coat of good deeds we are called to do. There's a bridle. Oh, we need a bridle to tame the savage beast, but this one's for our own tongues. There's a packet of pure and peace-loving wisdom. For these are the sown seeds sown in peace that will reach a reap reward of harvest. He's given us seed to grow good plants. There's the bread of grace and the haversack of humility. There's a timepiece that says, mark your days, plan. They're the iron nails of justice to the poor and humility for the wealthy that binds them together certainty. And now in James chapter 5, verse 7 through 12 that Dylan read for us, we find another crate washed up on shore. So come with me this morning. We're going to open up this crate and see what we find on this desert island shore. What's inside? We hear the creak of the nails and we peek inside with eager expectation. What will we find? <gasps> Three more essential tools for surviving and thriving in the cursed land. Inside the crate of James chapter 5 through 7 and 12, we find a compass, a bamboo plant, and shoe leather. You ever watch that cooking show where they open up the packet, the crate, there's three different foods inside and they have to make something? It's a little bit like that. A compass, a bamboo plant, and shoe leather. First thing we find in James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12, is a compass woven in. It's small. You have to kind of look for it to see it in this crate. It's not the biggest object, but it's certainly important. Inscribed on this compass, we look to the north point, and it says, verse 8, The coming of the Lord is now close at hand. The promise of Jesus' return is the compass for the believer that guides us through life. The captain is coming. In a world of weariness, the promise of the Lord's return is a compass for our lives, guiding every decision and step in its own way. This knowledge, this certainty, guides and governs life's journey through this strange land. It guides us when the world seems out of control. We watch the news happening in Israel and Ukraine, economic crisis around, and we say, life seems out of control. The compass seems spinning, but it finds a center again. It says the Creator is returning. Justice with Him. It guides us when we feel like the beasts just might take over, and the inmates are running the asylum. The king is coming. 
And in this jungle of injustice, where we look and say it doesn't seem right, it says the judge is coming. So this promise of Jesus' return is the compass through the wilderness. The creator, the king, the judge is coming, and he will restore all things. And then we open up, having put the compass that allows us to guide, we find a bamboo plant. What an odd choice. Because the bamboo is an odd, I just like saying bamboo, by the way, it's a fun word to say if you say it enough. It's an odd plant. I don't know if you've ever grown bamboo. But if you plant a bamboo seedling, it sits there for about three to five years. Can you imagine? I know some of you have felt like the last three to five years nothing has grown. But can you imagine actually planting a harvest, you get out there, and you come up the next year, Nothing. The rains came, nothing. Three years, five years later, finally. And you must water it constantly. But nothing grows for three to five years. And then it explodes. Bamboo in two months can grow a hundred feet. Can you imagine waking up every morning? Every morning there's three to five feet of growth. You would just be ecstatic. You wouldn't know what to do with yourself. But you've waited three to five years. <clears throat> So what's been happening all those years underground? Well, an enormous network of roots has been developing to support the bamboo's growth spurt. You ever notice that your children, their feet grow first before they're tall? You know why? Because if they grew tall and their feet didn't, they would fall over. So your feet have to grow so that you can be stable as the rest of your body. So if your son's feet are like, or your daughter's, well, whatever, are massive. Uh, by the way, your feet are this long. Have you ever done that weird test? It's really weird to think about, but um, it's because they're developing this foundation that allows for growth. We must be patient with them. Every drop of water for those three to five years makes the difference in the growth. And if we stop watering it, it will never produce this remarkable harvest. That patience is rewarded. The tensile strength of bamboo is 27,000 pounds per square inch. Steel is only 23,000. It's stronger per square inch than steel. It produces 30% more oxygen than most trees on the planet. It is one of the most versatile building materials ever made, ever given. Growing bamboo is, in essence, growing patience. You must wait for the harvest. It is the most patient of all plants and requires the most patience. Nothing, nothing for year after year and then a harvest like no other plant on earth. See, bamboo is patience seen in a plant. What do we say about Christianity, Dylan? It is a mystery revealed in a metaphor seen in a man. James says that to survive in this harsh land under suffering and hardship, you're going to need patience. That's a tough one to ask. Lord, please give me patience. Could you hurry up? And so we look at verses 7 through 11. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Notice how eagerly a farmer waits for the valuable crop. His patience over it till he has received the early and latter rains. In Israel, they would plant and the fall rains and the spring rains would come, two seasons. So you must be patient. Keeping up your courage for the coming of the Lord is not close at hand. He pulls the compass out again. Don't cry out in condemnation. We'll see how this fits in a moment, because it seems like an odd passage, but it will all fit together in a moment. Don't cry out in condemnation of one another, lest you come under judgment. Remember, the king is coming. I tell you, the judge is standing at the door. In illustration, brethren, of persecution, patiently endure. Take the prophets who have spoken as messengers from the Lord. Remember those who call... Call those blessed who endured what they did. You've also heard of Job's patience and have seen the issue of the Lord's dealings with him, how full of tenderness and pity the Lord was. All right, let's expand this. Like patience, or like bamboo, the word patience here is a little odd, a, a little foreign to us. Back in verse 6, the word patience meant being patient in circumstance, surgery. It hurts. We have to be patient until the healing comes. But he uses a different word here. It's made up of two little words. Uh, it's the word steam, or thumos, which is heat, and macro, which is big. So the first part is the word macro, which is big or large. We think of macroeconomics or macro growth. And the word thumos means anger or temper or burn with emotion. It's where we get the word thermal from. So it's big thermal, big heat. All right, you ever been mad? What does it feel like? Does it feel like little heat? No, no, that mad is big heat. Right? It's that big burn. But here it means long burn, slow burn. 
We are to be patient with people, not only our circumstances. James says when it comes to dealing with people, you need to have a slow burn, a long temper. As I've said before, all men are like steel. When we lose our temper, we're no good. James says that when it comes to patience, you need a long burn. And then he takes this bamboo plant and he shows us three branches. And he illustrates what this long, slow burn actually looks like. He inspires us, encourages, and illustrates. He says, be patient for the coming of the Lord uh, like a farmer waiting for the harvest. This I don't have to illustrate. Y'all know this. He says, notice how eagerly a farmer waits for the crop. One poet simply wrote this, look to the farmer. He waits with hope and expectation of reward. He waits a long time. He waits, yet works, while he waits. I used to bug Doug that the reason it says four by four on a farmer's truck is four weeks in the spring, four weeks in the fall. That's all you work. <laughs> but it's, the farmer works while he waits. We work while we wait. He waits depending on things that are out of his power with an eye on the heavens. He waits despite changing circumstances. He waits because he really has no other option. He waits because it does no good to give up. He waits aware of how seasons actually work. He waits because as time goes on, he understands that all he can do is wait. As Keith Kitchen once wrote, waiting is the hardest part of waiting is the waiting. So in our patience with one another, be like the farmer who knows that if I wait, there will be a beautiful reward. And he says, be patient in suffering like the prophets. Remember those we call blessed who endured. We admire patient people. We look up to them and say, what a gift. They were patient with me when I, my father had a very long fuse, but oh my, when it went off. Beware the wrath of a patient man, my mother would say. Remember those blessed who endured. Be patient in pain. Be patient in suffering. Be patient in pain. Be patient in pain like Job. Having also heard of Job's patient endurance and have seen the issue of the Lord's dealings with him, how full of tenderness and pity the Lord is. What makes us impatient? Well, each of you have your own triggers. But let me suggest three that James suggests. We are often impatient with unmet expectations. I thought it was going to happen. We grow tired of waiting. And so we pray, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I don't know if you've ever gotten tired waiting, saying, Jesus, why you don't come back? We grow patient with unmet expectations. We grow impatient in suffering. When we're suffering, we're not always patient. And oh my, we grow cranky when we're in pain. Pain shortens our fuse immensely. What if Job was patient, or was he cranky? James says, no, no, he was patient in his suffering. So we're impatient when our expectations are not met, when we suffer, and we're cranky. And he says, and then look what you do when you're mad. Those of you who've flown off the handle know what happens. What do we do? We take it out on others. That's why verse 9 is there. He says, I know you're cranky because you're impatient, and I know exactly what you do when you're impatient. You take it out on people. Look at verse 9. So don't cry out in condemnation of another brethren, lest you come under judgment. I tell you, the judge is standing at the door. James knows what's going to happen to us when we lose our patience. I get it, he says. People drive you crazy. But we know that the measure you measure will be measured to you. And that's why that's included in there. It's a direct correction or reminder that we do lose our temper with one another. And we judge and condemn and get cranky. James simply says, don't condemn the plant for not growing. Someday the master gardener will look for your fruits by patience. 1914, on the day that World War I started, Ernest Shackleton set forth on the HMS Endurance. He was going to do the greatest thing he could think of. They were going to walk across Antarctica, the Trans-Antarctic Expedition. They would go and they would set up food supplies and they would walk to the South Pole and then walk all the way across the Antarctica. But what they didn't realize, the ice was fresh and new and forming in greater amounts, and their ship, the Endurance, got caught in the ice and was crushed. And down it went, and they stood on the pack ice and said, now what do we do? <laughs> and for two years, they were stuck in Antarctica, walking across to what they thought, this time, north to safety, towards the southern tip of Argentina. And the story goes on. They went in little boats, went to a place called Elephant Down. If you ever get a chance to watch the Shackleton story, it's the story of human endurance that you cannot imagine. 
Thankfully, they had a photographer with them. But Shackleton's motto was this, by endurance, we conquer. That's what James said. By endurance, by patient endurance, the farmer reaps the reward, the prophet receives the blessing, and Job receives tenderness and pity from God. Don't condemn the plant for not growing, for by patient endurance we conquer. Tell your folks that. James says, I know you're in pain. Stretch out the boundary of your patience. Add some length to your fuse. So we got a compass. We got a bamboo plant, and then this third little object that seems there, we open up the crate and we find some shoe leather inside. What's that for? Verse 12. But above all things, my brethren, don't swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes simply yes and your no simply be no that you may not come under condemnation. He says there's something foundational that you stand every day on. That's, that's the very foundation of your walk that will keep you walking in Christ. And he says it's this. Simple honesty. He's not talking about swearing or cursing or something you might see written on a jacket. Those men's ministry will get that reference. He's not talking about that kind of language, curse words. It's swearing like taking an oath. When somebody says, so help me God, perhaps so you've been in court, and they ask you to swear an oath. In a world that James is writing to was a world without paper and ink. So people made contracts by their word. They would swear an oath. And like today's contracts, they could get complicated and they would use words like fine print to get themselves out of their obligation. I just have to read what Edmund Hebert writes because he explains it so much better than I could. In the Jewish writings, a whole tract is devoted to the subject of oaths. In the discussion of binding oaths, it's asserted that oaths that made by Shaddai, or God, or by Sabbath, by the Lord of the Sabbath, or by the merciful and gracious, or by him that is long-suffering and of great kindness, or by any substituted name, they are liable. But oaths by heaven and earth are exempt. In other words, if you swore by God's name in any sort of reference, you had to be held to that. But if you swore by heaven or earth, you could actually get out of the contract, because you didn't swear by God's name. So if I said, I will deliver to you four cows, I swear by heaven and earth, and I didn't deliver those four, you can't hold me to that, because I didn't swear by God. And that's exactly what he says. Don't swear by heaven or by earth. He's making a reference to cheaters, to those who were unscrupulous in their contracts. Oaths, which were made in the name of God, were held to be binding. Wherever those that made no mention of God were not held to be binding. Thus, the force of an oath to that all appearances seem binding could be evaded by minute inaccuracies in the formula used. They developed the fine art of hiding the truth behind their pious oaths. James says, stop lying, be honest, let your yes be yes. You see, they were manipulating the truth. In effect, they appeared to be telling the truth, but in reality, were lying and had no intention of keeping the contract. They found a way to get around the promise. So what does James say? Let your yes simply be yes, and your no simply be no. Stop lying. An honest yes and an honest no are all you get. The very shoe leather we walk on is honesty. We are people who tell the truth. You see, the foundation of our lives, the leather we walk on, is this honest declaration. Our word is our bound, our bond, trusted and true. It's interesting, according to Forbes magazine, the most ethical and honest company in the U.S. for the last four years running has been Capstone Turbines. I love this company. Do you know what Capstone Turbines makes? Turbines. <laughs> Five different kinds, all use the same. Basically, just different sizes of micro-turbine generators. Nothing fancy. What do we make? Microturbine generators. How do we make it? Five. What are they like? They're all the same. It's the most honest and ethical company in the U.S. right now. I just love their simplicity. When you go to their website, there's five pictures of turbines. You pick the one you want. That's it. That's honesty. They are who they appear to be. Be patient with one another. Be honest with one another. All right. James, in James chapter 5, opens up another survival crate. And what do we find? A compass. Keep your eye on the Lord's return. A bamboo plant, be patient, long fused with one another. I know you're in pain. Shoe leather, be honest with one another. And then we add this to the crates that have already washed up on shore. The map, the thick and warm cloak, the bridle. 
the packet of seeds, the bread of grace, the canvas haversack of humility that carries the weight, the timepiece of good planning, the iron nails of justice and humility, and now to this, the compass, the bamboo plant that grows into wood stronger than steel and shoe leather, how we treat each other. And beloved, I want to put to you this morning this simple truth, that when we look at these together, we discover something amazing. That in these boxes, crates, that have washed up on shore, there's enough here to build a safe harbor. There's enough materials granted to us to build Christ's community. There's enough here to build a safe community where we are free from lies, from pride, and from injustice. There's enough here to build a humble community where our yes is yes and our no is no, and if you say you'll be there, I can rely on it. There's enough law here to govern us. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's enough here to share with those who are in need and visit the widows and orphans in their distress. There's enough here to keep our hands warm, our hearts soft, and our eyes fixed on the coming of Jesus. There's enough here in James's commands to begin to realize thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this morning I want to challenge you. The next time someone gives you an idea, suggests a philosophy or a thought, or you listen to a song, a message, or a philosophy washes up on the shore of your life, open it up and say, huh, what can I build in my life or in the life of my neighbors and my family with this idea? I'm old enough, the only one I could clearly think of was Bach, BTO, Bachman Turner Overdrive, when they sang, looking out for number one. All right, let's take that. What can we build if I always look out for myself? Looking out for, I won't sing. That's a simple piece of idea that washed up in my generation sang it. Look it up. Freddie Mercury saying, love kills. It's an interesting thing to build a relationship on. So when somebody presents today, you say, what can be built with that idea? I was going to quote a bunch of talk show celebrities, but I didn't want to get in trouble. But when an idea washes up on shore, stop and say, what's in the crate? What can I build? If I follow that and live accordingly, what would I build around me more than simply myself? Until the day Jesus comes, there will be weeds. We are the kosher kings. The weeds will still grow, the darkness will still blanket the earth, and the beasts will still roar. You only have to watch the news or open up your Instagram account to hear the beasts roar. But I put to you this morning that until we get home, we will feel like we're not at home. If you feel like that, there's a reason for it. It's because it's true. We are not at home. Like the saints of Hebrews 11:16, we desire a better country. Like the people of God in 1 Peter 2, we are foreigners and exiles, and we feel it. But until that day, until that day, I believe we have been given all that we need to build a home in the wilderness. The very first National Film Board film ever produced was called The Drylanders. It's a story of a... Oh, veteran from the Boer War who brings his English bride to Saskatchewan. And the shot is long and far, and there's this prairie panorama of tall grass, and they get off the train and they're walking with their horse, their oxen, their horses, and they get to a spot in the middle of the ball prairie, and there's a stake on the ground. And he reads the number on the stake, and he looks at the land grant, and he looks at his wife, and the camera spins in a circle to the open prairie, and he says, we're home. <laughs> And she looks at him and starts weeping. <laughs> but in the crates, they carried the oxen and the train cars and the boxes as the film goes along. They build a home. They live through the dirty 30s and the drought, and the film ends with him on his deathbed, and the rain finally starts to fall. It's a beautiful film. See, until that day, I believe, like the drylanders, we have been given all that we need to build a home in a weary land. And I want to leave you with the words of the Spirit speaking through Peter in 1 Peter 2. To those who through righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life 
through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us a very great and precious promise that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil. Let me read that last part again in the middle. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Go. Go do what you do well. Go build. Father, in this land we are often weary. Sickness, disease, drought, political uncertainty, loss. We feel the wilderness every day. The wind that won't stop and the sun that won't yield. We are weary. But these crates of grace and goodness wash up on shore. And maybe that's why we gather, to be reminded of the goodness that you have given us. And this day, I pray that you would give a good gift to each and every person, for you are the Father of all good, in whom every good and precious gift comes down. And from here, let's go build your kingdom for your glory in this place you have given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close in song. I'd like you to stand as we close with He Hideth My Soul. If you want to follow in your hymn book, hymn number 333. 333. We'll sing all four verses, but we'll skip the chorus between verse 2 and 3.
you to join us and uh, for coffee as we continue the fellowship together. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless. <coughs>